once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of everybody involved in Bible Talk, including my wife Alice, who's over there, and my brother Mark over there, and those who are not with us at the moment, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are blessed that you can be with us to spend time in the Word, because it's a good thing to spend time in the Word. And the congregation said, Amen. <laughs> Okay, we're going to pick up, this is our ninth part of our study in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, we left off last week, we had just finished from chapter 2, verse 19. And so I'm going to start by reading verse 20, but I just want to, it, it ended in 19, talking about God's household. So in 2.20 it says, having been built, we're talking about God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. God's household having been built. You know, the message should be clear and simple enough because Jesus had said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. There is all too often a great danger when believers come together in church building and church growth programs. Because even when they accomplish their goals, their programs, <clears throat> or their committee's goals, they can, easy, they can easily do a lot of work and yet totally miss God's goals. That's why it says, you know, in Psalms, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And that's in Psalm 127. And that's a fact. God has to build it. Otherwise, you're laboring in vain. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, who was originally from Leeds, England, and uh, migrated to the U.S. years ago. I think he passed a, uh, back in the 90s. I'm, I'm not sure of that. But his passion, his heart was about revival. And one of the things he said is that revival is not about filling empty pews, which is often the church's desire. Revival is concerned about God filling empty hearts because that's God's desire. We are the tools in the hands of a carpenter, the carpenter, the master builder. Or as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7. It's got to be the Lord which is why his church, the assembly of believers, has been and still is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, as he says here. You know, let's talk about apostles for a moment. You know, Paul wrote to the Ephesians later, and he, uh, later in this letter, and he said, and he, the Lord, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, that's 11 through 13. Now, there, there are a lot of people today who say they don't believe that there are apostles anymore. They, and this, this doesn't count anymore. That was for the New Testament. Well, that would be true if you honestly believe that we have been built up to the unit and attained the unity of the faith. Do you think we have unity when there are thousands of denominations? To the knowledge of the Son of God? I mean, I, you know, there's a lot we just don't have. So there's still work to be done for this, what's called the fivefold ministry. So it's, it's truly important to understand how the early church, which was closest to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how they functioned. Nowhere is that more evident than in what Luke wrote in the book of Acts in the beginning, immediately following the day of Pentecost. Remember Peter went out there, I'm sure you all know. If you don't know about the day of Pentecost, go read Acts chapter 2. But on that day, Peter went out and he preached a sermon. And thousands were saved because he confronted them with the truth of Christ being the Messiah that they had killed, that we had all killed. 
by our sins. So there in Acts 2, I'm going to read from verses 42, 43, and 44. It says that they, these are the new believers, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's four things that are key, right? Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders, many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those had believed were together and had all things in common. First, the awe because of the word. Then, the wonders and signs. God is a God of good order. Do we have that backwards today? People are running around looking for the signs and wonders, and if they think they found the signs and wonders, then they'll be in awe of God. It's the other way around. When we know uh, and are in awe of the, the marvelous being that our God is, then the signs and wonders begin to happen. You know, I, I've said, we've had the opportunity to travel over a very good part of the world, I mean, a very large part of the world. And it's interesting to find where, you, where I believe we've seen more true signs and wonders. It's in those places where there is less material, prosperity, wealth, well-being. Because where there's not, people are more fixed on the things of the Spirit of God. Are you fixed on the things of the world or on the things of the Spirit of God? Are you in awe of God because of who he is, not because of what he does? Maybe because of what he has done. He saved a wretch like me. The early church was abiding in the word. It says that they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching continually. So they knew the truth. Remember Jesus said in, in John chapter 8, he said to the Jews who had believed, he said, if you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 6, John 8, rather, 31 and 32. The truth is, our Lord is awesome. Like I said, not because of the signs and wonders, but because of who he is and because of his love. And then the rest follows. I, mean, I see Christians running all over the place looking for signs and wonders. All right, let me just carry on in this. And it goes on in that verse and says, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, the cornerstone is the first stone. Remember, Jesus, it says, and Paul said in Romans 8, is the firstborn of many brethren. But I want to read you, this is from a secular publication, a definition of a cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. Everything is related to where the cornerstone is. Okay? So everything is connected to Jesus Christ, if he is the cornerstone. And if it's not... That building is not being built properly. All the other stones have to be set in reference to this stone, the cornerstone. Now, you know, it's never about your position in reference to other believers, although I think a lot of people believe that. But it's about being where the Lord desires to accomplish his purpose, in you and through you. Jesus was quoting from Psalm 118.22 when he said, Had you not ever read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Mark 12, 10. He's speaking to the people. This is the scripture. This is the word of God that they claim to love so much. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. So that's about the apostles. Maybe we'll get more into that, but I want to just go on to the prophets because it's about the apostles and prophets. Amos wrote, shepherd from Tekoa said, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3.7 God tells his prophets what's going on. Why? So that they may pass the message on to others. A prophet, a true prophet, bears an incredible responsibility to speak for the Lord God Almighty. 
What, a, what an incredible responsibility. What an incredible blessing. But indeed, it's a responsibility. Moses knew that, and it scared him. Oh my goodness, did it scare him. God sent Moses to speak to the sons of Israel. That's what it says, Exodus 3.14. And God sent Moses to speak to the Pharaoh, to the, the leaders of Egypt, to speak for him. That's what a prophet does, prophetes. He speaks for God. Uh, in, in Hebrew, the word is navi. And in Greek, it's prophetes, to speak for, okay? Moses was a prophet. Do you ever think of Moses being a prophet? He was a major prophet. That's what the word of God says. He was sent to bring God's word. Moses said, and this is from Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Then the Lord said, a couple of verses later, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That someone is Jesus. Then Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father had told me. John 12, 48 to 50. Jesus didn't speak anything on his own. He didn't do anything on his own. That's a, that's a servant. That's the heart of sermon. That's the same heart we're supposed to have, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. We had better hear and we had better obey the prophets, bearing in, the mind, in mind the words of the, the apostle, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4.1 What do you think the qualifications are for somebody to be a prophet? That's right. They have to have a Facebook account. I'm telling you, that's what it seems like to me. You know, James said, let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment. It's not about the ability technologically to be able to, to speak out. It is about the Spirit of God leading you to speak out or not to speak. What's the test? John says you've got a test of spirits for many false prophets. What's the test of a prophet? A true prophet must be correct in what he says. God doesn't make mistakes. And the prophet must counsel that, Deuteronomy 13, 4 says this, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. If a prophet is not telling you that, he's a false prophet. If you are not doing that, the Lord will require a true prophet to confront you and demand that you do, as in the days of Jeremiah. Because here's a, here is what a true prophet does. Lamentations 2.14. God spoke to Jeremiah and said, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. How often does that happen in our world today? A true prophet is not focused on how wonderful you are or what the Lord wants to, you to be rich or happier or prettier or more successful in, in the material things. Those things may or may not happen, but the Lord's goal for you is simply this. This is from an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a preacher, and a teacher named Paul. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn of many. Romans 8, 29. That's God's goal for your life, is you look like, you know, man was made in God's image. 
and that he was deformed by sin. God is bringing us back to that place where we truly look like Jesus Christ, God. And God's word is the tool that he uses to make us more like Jesus. The chisel, think of a statue. The chisel, sharper than any two-edged sword. He uses that to cut away things in us that are not like Jesus. All right, so I'm going to go now, verse 21, Ephesians 2.21. In whom the whole building, talk about Jesus, right? In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Being fitted together. How do you fit something together? Think about, you ever see these, see anything about, if you're ever into any kind of Egyptology, where they built all these incredible, I mean, not just the, not just the, the pyramids, but I mean, the temples they built, the, the Sphinx. They did that with hand tools on stone. Chisel or chip away. What's the most important thing to get two blocks to come together? It's to cut away all of the imperfection on the edges of them so that they come together and there's no bumps or anything to keep them apart, right? The chisel is used to cut away the rough edges so the individual pieces fit together. Now Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.5, and he said, you also, speaking to the believers, he said, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're being fitted together in order to grow into a holy temple in the Lord. That's what it says. Right? It, but it takes a lot of pieces to do that. How many stones make a temple? I want to read, I'm going to, I'm going to read a long selection here from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read from 14, verse 14 to 23. Listen. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. And if the, if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. For our less presentable members become more, much more presentable, presentable. Keeping in mind that the body is not one member, but many, Perhaps the, the word you in this verse, 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Did you ever consider that that word you is plural? I don't know that I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, but I know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Pray about it. It's plural. It is, after all, living stones, plural. That's what it says, right? Have you ever seen photos uh, of London or Berlin after the Second World War, after the bombing of those cities, the massive bombings? Have you seen the buildings that were reduced, to, literally reduced to rubble, bricks lying scattered everywhere in the streets? You know that there's nothing glorious there. Nor is there anything holy or glorious in a temple that's no more than scattered pieces. We need to stop boasting about our denominations and repent of our division. Because it's not what people see now. I'm telling you it's about what God sees when he looks down and he sees the division in the body after he instructed us, let there be no division among you. Consider it, pray about it, then repent. All right, we're going to move right along to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. 
I'm going to read through to verse 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation it was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. The stewardship of God's grace. Stewardship is not ownership. The steward is always responsible, answerable to the owner. We did a great teaching on steward, ownership, stewardship, and possession. If you write to me at office of BibleTalk.com, I'll send you a link to it. It is good that you trust in God. That, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is a grand understatement. But the question becomes, can God trust you? It's one thing if I ask if you trust God. But have you asked yourself, can God trust yourself, can he trust you? Paul wrote, for if I do this, talking about preaching the gospel, if I do it voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. That was to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 17. And then he goes on to, and writes to the Galatians in Galatians 2, 7. It says, I had in, I, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcision, he had been entrusted with it. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. And then 1 Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, and said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which I have with which I have been entrusted. Then to Titus, Paul wrote, but at the proper time manifested, even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted, according to the commandment of God our Savior, Titus 1.3. Over and over and over, Paul talks about that he had been entrusted. What does that mean? It means that God trusted Paul. God gave this stuff to Paul because he trusted him to be a faithful servant. When the Lord gives you a ministry, by the way, he doesn't put you in charge of it. You're still in charge. You're still answerable. You have a responsibility. You have to be faithful. Paul was. You know, we were in England. As you know, we spent a lot of time in England. We used that as a base to travel in other places. And I was doing a, a series of Bible studies in Oldham, England, for, for a group there. And one day, somebody asked me, I, I, really, I don't recall the circumstance, but I think it was kind of out of the blue. Why aren't we seeing the power of God more? Why aren't we seeing the things that they saw in the early church? And I thought about that, and I prayed for it briefly. I mean, right there and then, and I said, I think God is not working that power in us because he doesn't trust us. I don't believe God trusts us. That's, that may sound horrible. He trusted Paul. The question is, does he trust me? Does he trust you? You know, it says in Luke 16, 10, this is the words of Jesus. He who is faithful in very little, in a very little thing, is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. And I said this, I, I, this is what I taught about, and I wound up teaching about it a lot, all over England and other places. If you're driving down the highway, and the, and the speed limit on the highway is 70 miles an hour, and you're doing 80, why would God trust you? The Word of God says you're to be submissive to governing authorities. If he can't trust you to obey such a little thing as a speed limit, when he has commanded you to do that, why in the world would he give you Great power. I mean, if you had a little child and, you know, you give him a, a, a pop gun or a, and, he, and he misuses it, are you going to give him a bazooka? Why do you think we're not seeing the power of God as we should? Maybe it's because we have demonstrated to God that we're not faithful enough to use it the way he desires. Something to think about. Okay. <laughs> So he talks about God's grace, right? 
let me go back and read the verse. He has stewardship of God's grace. You know, when we lived in Belize, Central America as missionaries, and, and Mark was down there with us, uh, I got hit by a speeding semi truck. Alice and I, if you don't know the account, you can find out about it. We have the, actually have the book. You can go online and on our website and send for it. It's called The Master's Call. Because it was one evening when we hadn't been down there long, and we had a camp out in the, out in the bush. And Alice and I had gone in to meet some folks from Belize and have dinner with them. They turned out to be good friends of ours. And on the way back, it was nighttime, and the roads down there are, well, at least back then, are very, very dangerous to say the least. I mean, they're, they're wide enough for two cars, no lines, no lights, no nothing, no, nothing off to the side. And as we were going back to our camp, I, I came across a truck that was broken down, and the fellow was, you know, waving to get help. So I stopped, and after I stopped, I got out of the vehicle, and uh, another truck, an articulated lorry, a semi truck, came along, speeding, and never slowed down, never stopped, never, never turned, just ran right into us. And so I, I was hit, and I literally, I literally went flying through the air over our truck, you know, which was a full size Bronco which got demolished. And I wound up laying out by the side of the road and I was pretty well broken up. All the ribs on my right side were broken, my left shoulder was broken, my right uh, hip was broken, my pelvis was broken in three places, my knee was destroyed and my foot was up by my head. And I, I, I flew as an air crewman in the Navy and I've had an awful lot of survival training and first aid training and et cetera, et cetera. And I was, fairly certain that it was over, that I was about to meet the one that I love more than anybody, including my darling Alice, I, that I was going to come face to face with Jesus. And as I lay there, just this calm, this peace came over me, and I heard a still small voice say to me, do you believe what you've been preaching? Whoa. Now I have to tell you, that I have preached over and over and over about the miraculous power of God. And I had seen over and over and over the miraculous power of God. But when God spoke those words to me, do you believe what you've been preaching? Not once did I jump to the thought that he was talking about miraculous healing. I said, yes, Lord, I believe. Because what came to my mind instantly was I, I, I was pretty sure right then that I was about to come face to face with God Almighty. And you know what? I know what a sinner I am. I know my failings. And all of a sudden I knew what I believed in was amazing grace because that's what I preached. I preached the grace of God and I was absolutely at perfect peace and said, yes, Lord, I'm ready. And then I heard two wonderful, wonderful words from the Lord. He said, not now. So that's not the end of the story, but it was the end of that uh, problem that evening. So I'm still here. How many? That's almost like 30 years ago now. Been through a lot of other things, but I know the power of God. But there is no greater thing and nothing that should be more awe inspiring to us than the grace of God, the amazing grace. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for that grace. We thank you for the Apostle Paul who went before us. For all of the apostles, for all of the prophets, the apostles, all of those who were faithful, that you talk about in, in Hebrews chapter 11, Lord God. Those who were faithful to you, who are an example to us. Help us to be faithful like they were, Lord. Help us to stand fast, to stand strong, to trust in you, that you might be able to trust in us. That we might be able to serve you without any, any, any hesitation whatsoever. We thank you for your word, Lord, which does mold us and shape us into the image of your Son, Christ Jesus. We praise you, we thank you, that we can come together like this, Father, in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Well, until next week, why don't you write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you with your comments, questions, concerns. <laughs> so until next week, when we're back again, May the Lord our God bless you, bless you a lot, and use you for the glory of his name. 
Amen. Oh uh...